So, Father, thank you so much for your presence. And we know, Lord, and we believe without a shadow of doubt that you are already at work, you've been at work from the moment we stepped in, Lord, even from the moment we decided to come here, Lord. And I pray over these days, it will just increase our hunger and thirst for you, our desperation, our desire, and our experience of you, Lord. We want a greater measure. In Jesus' name. Amen. So if it, on your, uh, at the end of your, uh, I mean, after the, all the songs, there will be Revival at Pentecost, the first session. I've, I put the passages and I think I put a few bullet points. I don't know what they are because I have more over here, but they're just as a sort of a guideline as we go along. If you're really into pens are there and you can write notes and all the blank spaces are for that. There are also pads if you want to use. It's so Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 4. This is like an introductory session. It's supposed to be short. Let's see. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So by my count, this is the fourth revival in the New Testament. It's been, it's, it's sort of a span of 33 years since the beginning of the New Testament, 34 years, okay, the prophet here about John the Baptist. And I, I see that the fourth revival, the first revival was Christmas itself. I've got a sermon called the first Christmas was revival, you see the different elements of revival reflected, manifested in that first Christmas in the birth of Jesus, even before that birth of John the Baptist, birth of Jesus. The second revival was John the Baptist's ministry. Okay. So while the Christmas revival I've, I've taught, it was a, you saw the prophetic released in that revival. In John the Baptist's ministry, it was, of course, a baptism of repentance that he spoke about. And it was a revival in the, in the spirit of Elijah, calling the nation back to God. The third revival, of course, was Jesus' ministry itself. And the hallmark of that ministry really was the miracles, the signs and wonders. Of course, his teaching as well. But what was really known was that there were such miracles like the world had never seen, obviously. Commonplace. The supernatural became common in that revival. And then there, and then the fourth was Pentecost, which was just 10 days after Jesus left and 40, 50 days after he stopped his public ministry because of the cross and resurrection. At Pentecost, actually, we see all of that. We see the prophetic repentance, uh, miracles, and in a sense, because we live in the age of the Spirit, the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost is the basis for all revivals since then, all the revivals of the past 2000 years and counting. The Pentecost revival is therefore like a paradigm, it's a pattern for revival, which is why I thought I'll, I'll share that here just as an introduction. And then over the next two days, we look at another three sessions. Okay. We see, we see with Pentecost, as in every revival, there's a promise. Later on, later on, Peter says, this is what was prophesied in the Old Testament by the prophet Joel, that I will pour out my spirit on all people, young and old, men and women, and you know, all of that. So there was a promise in the Old Testament. There was also a promise that Jesus himself made. He said, go to Jerusalem and wait Till I pour out my spirit, till you receive power from on high to be my witnesses. So there was a promise in the Old Testament, there was a promise that Jesus made. That revival starts with a promise, then there's an event. The event was Pentecost itself, which we look at in a bit of detail today. And then, but it doesn't end, with, you see, revival doesn't end with the event, and then it's the life that follows. And in this case, in Pentecost, the life of the church that was born and that started to live, in a sense. 
So as I said, the promise of Pentecost was in the Old Testament in the not just Joel, though Joel was the main one because Peter references it, but what Jesus had told them to do. And then we see the event, the event of Pentecost was what? It, there was a sound like a mighty, it says violent wind here. Okay. Now I wonder whether a wind actually blew, it may or may not, but we are told that a sound came. We are actually not told that a wind came, we are told that a sound came. Okay. It's, it's the word is like a mighty windstorm. And I've actually put here roaring because when wind is really powerful, there's a sense of a roar. Yeah, and to me, it echoes the creation account, the Holy Spirit over the waters moving. And I don't think he was moving, you know, gently. I think there have been power, there have been a roar over the waters and then things start to happen as God speaks. Now this next section, I have no knowledge of this. I heard it in a Dutch sheet uh, clip of a sermon. Okay, he says that this word for wind, actually in Acts chapter 17, it's translated breath. The same word is translated breath. And he, sa he says that Luke was a doctor and he uses a particular word which is only used twice in the New Testament. He says that this, this word for breath was the word used when a baby took its first breath. You, you smacked the baby or whatever they did those days and then the baby took its first breath. And he said that this, this breath was called the breath of beginnings. And the baby began to live, so to speak. I mean, began to breathe. And he says that Luke being a doctor near used this word very specifically because something was beginning. Just as the spirit had breathed life into the first man, the spirit breathes life now into this body of believers and the church came to life. And then there were tongues of fire. I, I think the tongue refers to the shape. It was what Jesus had promised. Uh, or John the Baptist before him that I baptize with water, one and one is coming who will baptize with fire. Fire is a symbol of refining and purification, consuming. But it's also a symbol of zeal, of passion, of power. Most of all, I believe fire, and that's biblical, is a sign of his presence. Throughout Israel's history, we see fire as a sign of his presence. We see the pillar of fire guiding them. Uh, on Mount Sinai, when God appeared, it was always with fire. I mean, God spoke to Moses through a burning bush, where the, burn, where the bush did not burn up. And that sort of reminds me of the tongues of fire, because they were not burning. There were tongues of fire on them, but they were not burning. The sign of his presence. Uh, so many stories in the Bible where an offering is accepted by what? By fire coming down. No? So God being present, God being pleased, God uh, manifesting himself. And then we see other manifestations, in this case, tongues or different languages. They also were behaving in an odd way because later on people thought they were drunk. They could not have thought they were drunk because they were speaking in different languages. They would have thought they were, it was amazing they were speaking in different languages. But something, they were behaving in a way that looked like they were drunk. And so there was, there was some physical manifestation on their bodies. The supernatural, in a sense, has confirming signs, confirming what was happening, confirming what Peter was about to tell them. And later on, we'll, we'll speak more tomorrow about the supernatural as confirming signs. And so we have the promise, Jesus said, wait, and they waited. Then an event took place, and then we see the life of the church that proceeded from Pentecost. That's the second passage, Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. 
Every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I'm feeling like those uh, fiery preachers, no, on TV. You see, there's music playing in the background as they as they speak. Not this kind of music; it's some little dramatic. There's a particular chord that is played, apparently. What chord? Chord is that? There's a particular chord that you play when somebody is preaching a sermon. It's supposed to create the atmosphere. So Prema has created the atmosphere for my sermon. Tang 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 tang. What is Acts chapter two forty to forty seven? It's describing a church in revival. It's describing what proceeded from that event of Pentecost. I've always referred to this as the DNA of the early church, and it's the DNA that we want to have. You know, the manifestation can be different; it can look very different, but that these things, these seven or eight qualities, should be there in a church if it is the church that if it's the church of Jesus Christ. And it all looks very simple, you know. You you think that okay, maybe wonders and signs is something supernatural, but all of it is supernatural. All of these elements are supernatural. Every aspect is the work of the Spirit. Without Him, these things will not happen the way that you want them to happen. I mean, for example, I'll just give one example: devoted to the, to the apostles' teaching, okay, which is the study of the Word. Let's say. You know, some of the deadest places in the world are theological colleges. People go in full of desire to serve the Lord. They come out. I don't know how they come out, but they don't come out the way they should, because the spirit has been divorced from the word. If anything, even if it's the the word, you've got to have the Holy Spirit at the center of that study and all of that. Otherwise, there's no point. Which is why I say that every every aspect is supernatural in this passage. I remember. Some time ago, I mean, recently, uh, Melissa sent this thing. She was sent to everybody for all you know. Revival is what is that? Do not despise the revival you prayed for. The point being that you're praying for revival and you don't know how God will do something. And I remember some years ago, because of course, I've seen so many videos of revival and get so many stories, and you expect things to happen a certain way. And I remember Sukhya saying that. Quoting somebody who said that revival is family or something like that. What is that? Like revival looks like family. So she was referring to what God was doing in, in highway as a fellowship and uh, building up and 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 opening my eyes to the fact that that also is. And as I said, that's my point is that that that's also work of the spirit. That is also supernatural. That is the spirit at work doing something. So we have this promise, event, and life, and I want us to just uh, so even as we do things together, to recognize that the spirit is at work. Things may look may look natural, but there's extravagant generosity. For example, you know, everybody gave. It was a work of the spirit. It was revival taking place beyond what people might do in the natural. Yeah? And we want to believe that all of these things will happen as we spend time together, and to believe that, and to be open to the supernatural, to all of that. So I want to share these six things. I don't know if I've written them there. I put some quick points that as we move forward through these days, we want to be sensitive to the move of the spirit, okay? like the wind. Jesus said, "You cannot see the wind, but it blows." And the Holy Spirit is like that. So we want to be sensitive to the move of the Spirit. We are believing for a fresh breath of beginnings to be released in us, individually and corporately. Believing that that the that just like there was a sound of a violent wind, that that wind was the breath of beginnings. That the Holy Spirit is releasing a breath of beginnings here. Individually for each one of us, but also together. I don't think it's a coincidence that I think it's the first camp that all three cities have been represented in such large numbers. This almost the entire uh, groups. I mean, all the regulars of all the three cities 
are pretty much at camp. They are not here right now in the room. <laughs> Definitely not, but they are around somewhere. Okay? Or they will be coming tomorrow or whatever. But I think, I think it's the first camp that has been that kind of situation. And that's why I said corporately that believing that God wants to release a fresh breath of beginnings in Highway Bangalore and Highway Pona and Highway Bombay. And you will have noticed some of you from the, at the beginning we were we used to say that Bombay was highway. <laughs> no qualifier to that. And Highway Bangalore, Highway Pona, but it's highway. And that was mainly because Vinay insisted on that. It was like a Right, you know, Bombay is highway. But after a while, I just said, no, I can't keep doing that. So I, I just, so we're all equal in that sense. No, it's not like founding member of Bombay. Yeah? Uh, we want to be set on fire. We want to be purified, refined, consumed, and ignited for Jesus. We want the tangible sense of his presence. We want to be open to that. We want to be open to the supernatural, to manifestations, to gifts, to miracles. Uh, we want to believe that maybe gifts that we prayed for for so long will be received in this time. And we believe that he will further increase every aspect of the DNA in Hawaii. We see aspects of this already and, and uh, either Anila and I can take credit for it, or we can say Holy Spirit has been at work over these past five years, even before that, when we were at All Saints, uh, building that DNA, ex you know, expanding it, and to believe that even in these three days, we will further increase those aspects of the DNA of Highway in our midst. So I just want to submit this to us as a kind of an introduction to this thing that the that, 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 that paradigm of revival we want to see it flow over these next three days i'll be i won't be teaching in the evening then just tomorrow morning tomorrow evening and then sunday morning but you know even the creative activity that we do now there's a sense i mean it's we're going to be portraying revival in a sense through what we create there's the flag activity that renel will do in the evening which will just release us in worship, but of course it's Renel, so warfare and that word has to come in when Renel is doing something. But we believe that we'll be released in our bodies, our minds, our spirits in different ways. Uh, and in all of that, I just really want us to be open to what the Holy Spirit wants to do. I want to end this time. I want to read uh, there's this by Corey Russell initially I thought I'd play it but then sometimes we can't we can't uh, we don't get the the accent so what I'd like us to do is just maybe close our eyes and be open to the spirit for a few minutes uh, Corey Russell has got this spoken word it's called baptism of fire and I thought I would just uh, read it and, and maybe some of us are not ready at this time for all that God wants to do, but we just want to be open. And sometimes some people are like fully charged up and, and ready for uh, to explore into revival, and others are just maybe just take the first step, and, and that's okay. Yeah, but I thought I would I would read this. It's it's a prayer, it's a declaration, and and we just wait on the Lord. I'm reading what he's written. It's called Baptism of Fire. And let's make it our own prayer. My prayer for the baptism of fire. John the Baptist declared it. I baptize you with water, but there is one coming who you do not know. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. God, I lift up my voice before your throne right now. I lift up this generation, this nation before your throne. God, we need the fire of the Holy Spirit. We need that cleansing fire. 
that consuming fire, that burning fire. Lord, our hearts have gotten cold, hard, indifferent. Our lives are filled with sin and apathy, complacency, compromise. Our garments are dirty, O oh God, and we need you. We need the fire of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, you said, this is why I came to send fire on the earth. And how distressed I am until it is accomplished. God, we cry out before your throne right now. Send the fire of the Holy Spirit. Baptize this generation in the fire of God. Burn up, God, all the chaff of dead religion. God, remove all of the sin and the compromise and the apathy. Set our hearts on fire again, O oh God. Father, set our hearts on fire again. Make us tender again in your love. You said, set me as a seal of fire upon your heart. Oh God, I pray that Jesus would be the fire on the heart of the church again. Oh, that we would love you above everything else and every other lover would fall to the wayside and that Jesus would be first place in our lives. We ask you for the baptism of fire. Right now, right now, let's lift up our hands and ask him for the baptism of fire. God, I ask you in the name of Jesus, release the fire. Release the cleansing fire. Release the purging fire. Release the refining fire. God, I pray that you would bring forth a bride out of every tribe, tongue, people and nation. That you would begin to shine, God. That you would begin to glow in your glory. That our hearts would be set on fire. That our eyes would be set on fire. Our lips would be set on fire. Release the fire of the Holy Spirit. What you did on the day of Pentecost, do it again, God, in this place and all over the earth. God, remove every other lover and set us on fire. A radiant bright shining in your glory, filled with your spirit, moving in your anointing, O oh God. We just lift our hands right now and say, God, release the fire. Right now, God, set our hearts on fire, our eyes on fire, our hands on fire, our spirits on fire. Jesus, you are the burning one. Set the church on fire, we pray. Release it, we pray. In the name of Jesus. Right now, ask him for the fire. Holy Spirit, we ask you to baptize us with your fire. Tenderize our hearts in the fire. Just wait on him right now. Holy Spirit, come. Jesus, I want the flame that's in your eyes to be in my heart, to be in my spirit. I want to love what you love and I want to hate what you hate. I want to love your righteousness, I want to love your beauty and I want to hate wickedness. Put your fire in my heart, Jesus. Let it burn away all the apathy, all the complacency, all the indifference. Burn it away in me, Holy Spirit. I want to be filled with your zeal. I want to be filled with your fire. And right now I'm asking you, we are asking you, touch us with your fire. Touch us with your fire, God. We just wait upon you. <clears throat> 